Well, that's what we're going to hear the entire lecture today about. And we're going to think about it and engage at the end in a profound discussion that will blow away our minds. <laughs> and David will decide to go to one of our... Ken. Ken? Yeah, that's yes, the one. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Beautiful. <laughs> Do you know which university you're going to try to go to? No. no. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's just a program for uh, the summer. And okay. so, uh, yeah, it's uh, three weeks in Kenya, and then um, there will be six weeks of preparation for that. Okay. So, yeah. Ready. So, Africa. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. I thought for a second you went to Canada. Do you need this? Montreal. Yeah, 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 they yeah, speak yeah, French. Yeah, right. <laughs> Do you need this? Oh, yes, I, I guess I need. So. We still one minute. We still have one minute to, you know, have fun and ask how are you doing tonight. Pretty good, yeah. Very nice to see you here. And is it up? Oh, sorry. You've been working on the stand-up routine. Yes, 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 yes. But I think I would fail. <laughs> no, it's you know. A uh, friend of mine, actually, who watched our first um, um, performance, we started on time, and she's from Purdue. She was very impressed because she was a little bit late, and she's like, I can't believe you are so punctual. Everything is wonderful. It's everything working. <laughs> I'm like, yes, we're good. So, but now it's 6.30, and it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker in the series of Ro When Robots Ruled the World, which is the engagement series uh, organized by um, College of Letters and Science. And our presenter tonight is Joshua Horn, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. I would find that extremely shocking about what you're talking about because they are because they are very far behind, and I have a real good, solid base to use for what I'm talking about, okay? Okay, because but if, no, may I introduce the presenter so yes. he can speak, and then we can ask questions. Schools like Harvard and Yale, and, everything, and even more importantly, schools like West Point and Annapolis, they're way beyond understanding even what you're talking about, where we don't even have, like artificial intelligence, They've already figured out stuff with satellites that can lift objects and eliminate the need for me. Oh my God, even further. So today, that's why I'm so excited to present Professor Horn, who's been doing this work. He's professor of philosophy, associate professor of philosophy, but you also have cognitive science and not only interest, but um, credentials and thinking about robots, AI, and, future, and metaphysical questions, so questions of ethics and rights. So I'm really looking forward to hearing him speak. And he joined UWSP in 2013. He teaches philosophy, as I said. And he um, is very happy that in his classes, students consider very difficult uh, but essential questions of who we are, what death is. I'm, I'm interested in that one, right? Uh, and he specializes in 17th and 18th century philosophy, especially on the thoughts of Spinoza, Leibniz, and Immanuel Kant. In addition to interest in modern philosophy, Professor Horn maintains an active uh, interest in contemporary analytic metaphysics and philosophy of mind in the fields of modality, causation, free will, philosophy of religion, and cognitive science. So today he will talk to us about robots, the case for robot rights. Thank you so much. Good evening, and thank you to Vera for the very kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be here tonight to make the case for robot rights, drawing on insights in metaphysics, epistemology, and jurisprudence. A few years ago, I had the privilege of giving a talk in UWSP's community lecture series called Ethics and Conscious Machines. In that talk, I argued that if machines are conscious, we may have ethical obligations to them. But tonight, I want to talk not about moral rights and obligations, but legal rights and obligations. More specifically, I want to do two things. First, I want to problematize the way that we think of robots as something fundamentally different than ourselves, 
Robots are not other in many of the most important senses of identity. Human identity is becoming increasingly like machines, and machines are becoming increasingly like humans. And in the very near future, some robots will be indistinguishable from humans. This conclusion about human identity will have consequences for the second thing that I want to talk about. Uh, what legal rights, if any, should robots have? What legal rights, if any, should robots have in light of the fact that they will be indistinguishable from humans? In short, I want to show that there are legal arguments already being made, successfully, mind you, to grant legal personhood to robots based on arguments put forth primarily by animal rights and rights of nature advocates around the globe. There are a ton of interesting philosophical questions about robots. One of the most basic questions revolves around trying to identify the necessary and sufficient conditions for when a robot might gain personhood. Philosophers often make claims about these conditions by drawing on a variety of properties that we might take to be interchangeable but are in fact very different. According to these different conceptions of robots and personhood, robots must be conscious, intelligent, sentient, autonomous, possibly have intentional mental states, just to name a few of the conditions that people sometimes talk about. The literature on these topics is vast and controversial, but I'm going to cheat tonight. I'm going to sidestep all of them. As much as I love to think about those issues, and I'm happy to return to them at the discussion at the end, my goal tonight is to show that regardless of what our philosophical attitudes towards robots and personhood might be, we're still going to ultimately have to create public policy decisions about these entities. I want to begin tonight by showing a couple of recent examples of how robots are already starting to take on human characteristics. Sophia, who you might have heard me talk about before, uh, was a robot developed by Hanson Robotics. She's appeared on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon and also served as the ambassador for uh, the United Nations Development Program. Hanson Robotics states that Sophia is a hybrid machine running both artificial intelligence software along with human input depending on the circumstances. Hanson Robotics insists that her artificial intelligence is very advanced and that while some of her famous interactions like singing and playing rock, paper, scissors with Jimmy Fallon are programmed and not spontaneous, they insist that would be no different than the programming that humans would do when they, for instance, prepare for an exam or a big lecture. Just a few short years after Sophia was created, a different robot named Amica was developed by Engineered Arts. Although Amica cannot do much aside from express human facial animations in a fairly realistic way, the goal is to serve as a platform for more developed artificial intelligence software in the future. So imagine an operating system that can communicate in a way indistinguishable from humans, regularly pass the Turing test, and then put into a body that's even more realistic than Amica. Sophia and Amica are very early rudimentary robots, and it's clear that they're not human. So we can put these robots like Sophia and Amica on one end of the spectrum uh, of a robot that appears to take on the features of an organic entity. And on the other end of the spectrum, we might put an organic entity that appears to take on the characteristics of a robot, like Xenobots. So researchers at Tufts University, Harvard University, and the University of Vermont made headlines just a couple of years ago by publishing uh, and promoting their work on what they call xenobots. Living machines. They are living because they are biological organisms. These are stem cells taken from the Afri African clawed frog, Xenopus labus. They are machines because they can be programmed to do things like gather other cells. Most remarkable though, these living robots have the ability to self-propel and since December 2021 have shown the ability to replicate. While sexual and asexual reproduction are common in biological organisms, the researchers observed that these living robots were undergoing what they call kinematic self-replication, a phenomenon theorized by the mathematician John von Neumann in the late 1940s for something that robots would one day be able to accomplish, whereby they would produce copies of themselves from their parts. This, they contend, is what the xenobots are doing. Sam Kriegman, 
a postdoc fellow at the Wyss Institute at Harvard University, discussed the limited success of kinematic self-replication up to this point, stating, quote, we found that if you just relax the assumption that the robot has to be made out of metal and circuit boards and electronics, and instead you use living cells, then von Neumann machines are actually kind of easy to make, unquote. One researcher at Tufts, Michael Levin, told NPR in December 2021, quote, the distinction between a robot and an organism is not nearly as sharp as we used to think it was. These creatures, they have properties of both. Levin's point here is exactly right. The gap between biological organisms and traditional robots is becoming blurred in remarkable ways. And not in some super future science fiction imagined world, but right now. So in some cases, robots are becoming more human-like, and in others, living organisms are becoming more robot-like. Let me complicate this matter using uh, a very famous paradox. So one of my fav favorite philosophical paradoxes dates back to Eubulides in the fourth century BC. I think about this paradox all the time and use it to make sense of a very confusing world. The Sorites paradox, or the paradox of the heap, is a puzzle that illustrates the point that vague predicates make it difficult to classify certain objects at the margins. So as you can see here, the green and the red at the ends of the spectrum are clearly distinguishable from one another. But each step along the way is indistinguishable from each other in any meaningful way. So typically you can think about the Sorites paradox as something like the paradox of, it's called the paradox of the heap. So how many grains of sand must uh, there be for something to constitute a heap? How many hairs must something have to constitute not being bald anymore? These are puzzles because it seems unlikely that one grain of sand or one hair would be the difference between not having a heap and then having a heap. But it also seems arbitrary and unlikely that the 600th grain of sand wouldn't make a heap, but the 601st would. The same puzzle can be applied to humans and robots. How many synthetic parts need to be incorporated into a human before the human ceases to be human or it's indistinguishable? Or put another way, how many properties of humans can be applied to robots until they cease to be robots? So it seems intuitively clear that when grandma has a hearing aid, she's still human. And it might seem intuitively clear that grandma with a pacemaker also is a human. But if we replaced all of grandma's parts such that she effectively looks like Optimus Prime, I told Carrie I would find some way to work Optimus Prime into this talk, uh, such that grandma is in, you know, just completely synthetic, where should we draw the line? At what point, if any, would grandma cease to be human? This puzzle is dramatized in the film Terminator Salvation. In this clip from Terminator Salvation, one of the machines sent to assassinate John Connor, the, the leader of the resistance, was born a human and donated his body to science. When Marcus Wright wakes up in the future, he does not realize that his body has been augmented 
so that he's also a machine. So what is Marcus? Is he a human with machine parts? Is he a machine with human parts? Is he some entirely new entity? What I love about this clip is that we're not questioning whether something else is a machine. For in those cases, we might find some sort of ad hoc reason uh, to distinguish us from them so as to preserve our humanity. Instead, Marcus doesn't recognize what sort of thing he himself is. And honestly, I'm not so sure either. He has biological and synthetic parts throughout his body, but not just in mundane places, but also in his joint nervous system, arguably the place most important for one's identity. This coming together of man and machine that I've been describing tonight may look something very much like Marcus from the Terminator film. Now to be clear, I've not made any kind of metaphysical grand claims here about the nature of consciousness or intelligence or sentience or autonomy or intentionality or what it means to be essentially a human or essentially a robot. I cheated and sidestepped all those questions to get to an epistemological one. We might not definitively know what sorts of entities are human and what are robots because the metaphysical issue of personhood will remain unsettled. In fact, like Marcus, we might not even know the nature of our own identity. But once humans and robots become indistinguishable, such that it becomes impossible to distinguish us from them, we will be confronted with all sorts of interesting philosophical and political and legal questions. One of the most important of these is what sorts of legal, what sorts of legal rights, if any, should these entities have? That's the second question for, which, for tonight for which I will now turn. It's difficult to conjure up a philosophical question that does not lead to some kind of practical consequences. Human behavior is dependent on thoughts, beliefs, and values. And so it stands to reason that our philosophical thoughts, beliefs, and values would have real world implications. To illustrate this point, here are three quick general examples that show the way that we identify and define something has practical consequences in the form of uh, public policy. So I'm going to illustrate this point uh, by very briefly, very briefly, talking about torture and infrastructure and abortion. So during the war on terror fol uh, following the tragic attacks on September 11, 2001, the United States State Department carefully distinguished torture from torture light. Torture is explicitly outlawed by the Geneva Conventions, but torture light was a newly coined term to employ against alleged terrorists. Whereas torture was violent, mutil mutilating, and brutal, torture light uh, was included to interrogation techniques like sleep deprivation, noise bombardment, forced standing. The way in which we defined torture and delimited it had real world implications for the treatment of prisoners. In fact, many were not called prisoners at all because prisoners of war are a protected class in international law. Prisoners of war cannot be tortured, but enemy non-combatants can be aggressively interrogated with torture light techniques. Enemy non-combatants, like torture light, were newly developed signifiers that had real world implications. For most of the first year of President Biden's first term in office, the White House tried desperately to pass an infrastructure bill through Congress. Although he was successful last November in signing the trillion dollar bipartisan bill into law, there was significant disagreement along the way, not just in terms of whether and how much to approve in the spending bill, but also in the even more basic question, what is infrastructure? Roads and bridges were clearly infrastructure, but what about spending related to healthcare or workforce development? What about spending related to high, ice, to high speed internet access to rural communities? Did these items count as infrastructure too? The following two images really capture the difference in how Republicans and Democrats disagreed about the nature of infrastructure. So the left image is from the Senate RPC website, and the image on the right is uh, an early image that was on the White House's website. And it very clearly shows uh, the, the way that they disagreed about what constituted infrastructure, and that disagreement about defining something had real-world implications. 
Finally, during the oral arguments last year for Dobbs v. Jackson, the Supreme Court case which overturned the landmark Roe v. Wade ruling, the justices openly disagreed about the nature of personhood. Although the case before the High Court also raised questions about when it's appropriate to overturn precedent, what rights are established by the text of the Constitution, and the legal justification which undergirded Roe, there was also concern about personhood itself. Associate Justices Alito and Sotomayor, for example, raised questions related to whether a fetus can feel pain and whether a fetus at the time of conception can be given the protections that personhood requires. Much of their disagreement related to the necessary and sufficient conditions for personhood because once personhood is established, certain constitutional rights are arguably owed. And when, to use the sorties paradox from earlier, a fetus is sufficiently developed enough to gain those rights. I bring up these issues of torture and infrastructure and personhood to say that we're often at odds with one another on basic philosophical questions. And yet, we must nevertheless act on our limited knowledge for the purposes of creating law and public policy. It's simply impossible to be agnostic. Both our voice and our silence have consequences. And the same will be true for our understanding of robots. Some of us will have intuitions and find arguments persuasive that machines are worthy of legal protections. And some will have intuitions and find arguments persuasive that machines are not, and indeed could never be worthy of legal protections. But instead of just pointing toward intuitions that we may have, I want to share some recent social science research on robots that may have implications for our attitudes toward robot rights. And then I want to point to a couple of arguments to make the case for robot rights, which draw on the literature uh, from, from environmental ethics. So in one study of human-robot interaction, the researchers concluded that human-like robots were more likely to elicit changes in the nonverbal behavior of machines, the nonverbal behavior of humans, than machines which were not human-like. Uh, the findings became even more significant in a separate study, which made conclusions beyond just nonverbal behavior. In this second study, researchers concluded that a physically embodied robot tended to elicit more, more empathy than a disembodied one. A third study concluded that the appearance of the robot affected the likelihood that humans would attribute moral responsibility, that is, praiseworthiness or blameworthiness, to the machine. And perhaps most remarkably, at least I thought so, a fourth and final study that I'll mention concluded that movement might be even more important than the appearance of the robot in eliciting positive sentiments toward those robots. Consider the following short video of robots in motion, and then ask yourself whether motion matters to you more than something like intelligence or consciousness.
I find that way more interesting and concerning than Sophia who can tell a joke or tell you what day of the week it is. Generally speaking, social scientists agree that our attitudes towards robots will be contingent on two variables. The extent to which the observer generally anthropomorphizes objects on the one hand, and the extent to which they find anthropomorphic qualities in the observed robot on the other. Though to be sure they disagree on to which of these variables is more important and the degree to which they matter. But there does seem to be broad agreement that when humans engage with something that communication seems possible, people tend to be more empathetic. And while we may have intuitions that the intelligence or rationality of the robot is of paramount importance, research suggests that that's not true. In one set of studies from 2014 and 2015, the researchers concluded, concluded that emotionality, much more than intelligence in robots, elicited anthropomorphic feelings in their subjects. They also found that embodiment is more important than, hu than human uniqueness in eliciting those anthropomorphic sentiments. What these studies collectively suggest is that there are good reasons to believe that if a robot is embodied, can communicate, move autonomously, and display emotions, then there's a greater likelihood that humans will anthropomorphize them. And if humans anthropomorphize robots, there's a greater likelihood that robots will elicit feelings of empathy. And given that we can't be agnostic about the rights of robots, there's good reason to feel that robots which elicit empathy might have legal protections extended to them. Even if we could agree on the nature of highly controversial philosophical properties, such as consciousness and intentionality and the ones that I mentioned earlier, there would still be lingering questions related to what, if any, rights and legal protections these machines should be given. In the last part of my remarks tonight, I want to make the case for robot rights by pointing to two sets of legal arguments currently being put forth all over the world. More specifically, I want to show how advocates for robot rights are using arguments from animal rights and the rights of nature to make their case. Generally speaking, animal rights advocates and defenders of the rights of nature argue that legal protection should be extended to non-human entities for two sets of reasons. According to the first set of reasons, advocates make an argument from analogy, suggesting that entities in question concern that entities in question possess certain properties that we share with humans. And because humans have rights based on those properties, the entities in question deserve those rights as well. For example, Peter Singer famously defends animal rights on the grounds that some animals are sentient, that is, they can experience suffering or happiness. And since this trait is shared by humans and some animals, those animals deserve legal protections as well. Others have claimed that because animals have interests, just like humans, they deserve legal protections. Because some animals are conscious or intelligent, traits shared by humans, they deserve legal protections. In contrast to this properties-based approach, there is a relations-based approach, uh, which on the relational view, animals should be given legal rights not because they share certain properties with humans, but because they stand in a certain relation to us. For example, some advocates of animal rights have argued that animals should be protected because human interests would be harmed if they didn't have those legal protections. So human interests are used as a legal cover for protecting animals. We can straightforwardly apply the properties or relations-based arguments to robot rights. So consider the properties-based rights, the properties-based approach first. If some animals have legal rights because they possess the properties of being intelligent or conscious, then the robots that are deemed intelligent or, con or conscious could be extended the same legal rights too. Notice, we still may disagree about whether that animal is conscious or intelligent, just as we may disagree about whether the robot is intelligent or conscious. The animal or the robot just needs to appear to have those properties to enough people to create policies which protect them. After all, we ultimately don't know, we don't even know whether other humans are conscious or intelligent, but we create policies as, as if they are. Put simply, just as we have extended legal rights to animals based on the best possible interpretations of their properties, we might also have to do the same for robots. If you consider the relations-based approach instead, 
On this model, robots deserve legal rights because they stand in certain relations to humans. Historically, one of the most important relationships, uh, one of the most important relations that has been used to justify the extension of non-human rights is societal need. Both ships and corporations have gained legal rights to fulfill certain societal needs, drawing on arguments from this relations-based approach. Termed persona ficta in law, ships and corporations are examples of non-human, non-natural entities that nevertheless have legal standing to fulfill societal needs. Ships were given legal standing several hundred years ago because they moved about in jurisdictions outside of the, outside of the uh, sovereignty of nation states, and there needed to be some way to hold them legally responsible for their actions. Corporations were given legal standing to shield humans from uh, liability. The very same kind of argument could be used to justify robot rights. So long as granting rights to robots would serve a practical human purpose, then rights could be granted. It's easy to imagine uh, human ends that could be served by granting rights to robots. Uh, for instance, we might attribute legal rights to zoomorphic robots to keep people from developing habits which might lead them to, to harm real animals. Or we might attribute legal rights to anthropomorphic sex robots because we don't want to allow people to cultivate, cultivate vicious habits in their sexual encounters with other humans. Here's one final example from, this is just from the last year, to show that the role that robots might play in our entertainment and education might be enough to give them rights. This might look like a robot, but it's a robot. Nobody believed it was a robot. Everybody believed it was real. It's an impressive feat of engineering, but it's a much bigger deal than that. This robot could save the marine park industry and free the 3,000 dolphins, whales, and porpoises that are basically locked up. You can, you can sugarcoat it, you can paint their tank, but they're literally locked up. And that's the complicated problem with zoos and marine parks. On one hand, we lock up wild animals for our Okay, well then you can step outside, but right? you can step outside then. It has to be loud enough because they're filming it. Is the 
deepest and most effective type of education. I've seen the movie where they make robot dinosaurs, and it does not end well. Um, I was blown away when I saw that. I was, there's no way that's a doll, that's a that's a robot, and it was, yeah. So imagine one wirelessly that's running on its own AI. It's remarkable. I guess the uncanny valley doesn't apply to to animals, right? We notice, yeah. So. So in addition to the animal rights movement, the rights of nature movement is another way that we might make the case for robot rights. The crux of the rights of nature movement is the rejection of the dualism between humans and nature. Instead, advocates of the rights of nature hold that humans are not distinct from nature and that all organic life is connected. Broadly speaking, there are two views in environmental ethics that have implications here for robot rights. The biocentric view, uh, first of all, is that all living things possess inherent worth. By contrast, the ecocentrist, view, the ecocentrist view is that things are worthy of ethical and possible legal consideration if they're included in the relationships of a biotic community, which may include both organic and inorganic things. So robots may be included in the sphere of legal and ethical and legal consideration on the biocentrist view, uh, if they can be deemed to be a living entity, that is, if they can approximate the functioning of something like a human brain. As one commentator remarks, quote, theoretically speaking then, intelligent machines could conceivably be considered moral persons under a biocentric approach, assuming their cognitive abilities exceed those of plants and animals. The case for robot rights is even easier to make from the perspective of ecocentrists, who already extend ethical considerations to broader communities than just humans. Advocates of the rights of nature have already been very successful both in the United States and abroad. In 2006, the first municipality in the United States passed a rights of nature ordinance. This ordinance from Tomeco Borough in Pennsylvania contested the dumping of sewage by corporations. In 2008, Ecuador enacted protections for the rights of nature into their constitution. And in 2019, the Indian Constitution included an even broader declaration. The Indian Constitution writes, quote, the, the entire animal kingdom, including avian and aquatic, are declared as legal entities having a distinct persona with corresponding rights, duties, and liabilities of a living person. All the citizens throughout the state of Haryana are hereby declared persons in loco parentis, as the human face for the welfare and protection of animals, live and let live. Indigenous peoples have been very successful to advocate for rights of nature. In 2016, the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin included the rights of nature in their tribal constitution to contest oil and gas expansion into their sacred lands. A year later, the Ponca Nation of Oklahoma made a similar move to contest fracking on or near their reservation. In 2018, the Ojibwe extended legal rights to wild rice to protect their dietary staple from industrial uh, activity and harmed water quality and introduced genetically modified organisms into their ecosystems. The Magpie River in Quebec was granted legal personhood in 2021 with several rights 
entailed by such legal personhood, including the right to flow, the right to be safe from pollution, and the right to sue. These are just a few recent examples of how indigenous peoples have extended modern rights to non-human entities. All of these arguments touted by rights of nature advocates largely fall within those properties or relations frameworks that I described earlier. Put simply, if chimpanzees, rivers, rice, ships, and corporations can be shown to have legal rights, there's good reason to believe that the same kinds of arguments might also successfully extend to robots. The notion of natural rights is a relatively recent phenomenon, emerging only in the, in the 17th century. In the span of only 300 or so years, our collective political mindset has gone from thinking that we have no natural rights to thinking that we just have a natural right to life, to thinking we have a natural right to life and liberty and property, to thinking that we have a natural right to paid vacation, at least according to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. History has shown that natural rights have both grown in number and grown to whom they apply. The rights of white male property owners were slowly extended to women, children, ethnic minorities, homosexuals, animals, natural entities like rivers and the sky, to non-natural entities like ships and corporations. In short, the legal sphere for rights continues to get wider and wider, even though there may be setbacks in the accumulation of those rights. The only way to imagine that robots will not at least have some rights, at least some robots having some rights, is to assume that the extension of rights will arbitrarily stop at robots when it didn't stop for animals, the natural world, or non-natural entities like, sh like ships or corporations. If robots are to be given rights, we might wonder what kind they should have. After all, corporations have been afforded the protections of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment for almost 150 years. And since 2010, they're also protected by the First Amendment, if you remember the ruling from Citizens United. So perhaps it's not that strange to imagine a scenario in the very near future where robots may soon be able to voice their own opinions without fear of government overreach or to practice their own religious beliefs. Perhaps they will also have the right to keep and bear arms or be afforded counsel in criminal proceedings. Perhaps they may have intellectual property rights or the rights to be represented by labor unions. The rights that they, have may, the, the rights that they may be granted will be largely contingent on the kinds of robots they are on the one hand and then the societal need or, the other, or, or other relation on the other. So what do you think? As the gap between humans and machines becomes smaller and smaller, do you think that we will find ways to be inclusive toward robots, as I suggest here? Or will we find ways to exclude robots from the moral and legal sphere and insist that humans are not just unique, but fundamentally so? in a way that robots will never be human and humans will never be robots? The best answer to these questions will be informed by our shared history, the insights developed from the wealth of human arts and literature, and our philosophical and religious beliefs about human nature. At this point, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks very much. Dean Hagen. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, well, so animals have, are in the same situation. Disabled people are in the same situation. Children are in the same situation. Uh, people can sue on their behalf. You can have legal proxies that sue on their behalf. So what happens in these situations is you would have adv legal advocates uh, suing on their behalf based on the rights and duties that, or based on the rights that they have and the duties and the obligations that are not afforded to them. So it, it's fundamentally no different than, you know, you, you, even fully rational people can be represented by counsel. Yeah. So you 
very nicely sidestepped some important questions at the beginning, and I understand why you did it, but I don't want to push you a little bit. No, no, that's fine. Um, it seems to me that the actual ability to suffer is more ethically compelling than the appearance of suffering. And I can imagine a scenario, given your talk, in which we extend rights to robots based on their appearance that we don't extend to animals, even though they seem to be more capable of actually suffering. So I guess my question is, of the arguments that you put forward, what is your sense of what seems to be the better argument? What is your sense of what seems to get to those sort of ethical questions the most yeah. clearly? I think the, the properties-based approach is very controversial. Uh, and, le and the legal arguments that have been used for the properties-based approach have not got as much traction as the relations-based approach, probably because it is just very controversial. Uh, it's very hard to prove that this other thing is conscious or intelligent or feels pain. I mean, it's hard to even figure that out with humans. When you go to a doctor, as much scientific evidence as we have and as, much mach as many machines as we have, there, nobody can tell whether or not you're in pain. Right? If you remember when you go to a doctor and they say, are you in pain? On a scale from the bad smiley face to the good smiley face, it's because there's not a machine they can hook you up to to objectively determine whether you're in pain or not. Uh, pain is, an, is a mental state, and it's hard to objectively measure those. Uh, the relations-based approach has been more successful because you're able to smuggle in uh, protections for those entities based on human needs. So like ships and corporations were given rights based on that society, based on that relations approach, but it was to satisfy some human purpose, which is why that I brought up the, the animals and the sex robots and these different kinds of examples like this. That if it serves humans, there might be reasons to afford them protections. That, at least so far, that's been more successful. So the standard is pregnant. Well, uh, this, the standard is you're not going to be able to definitively prove these things. Uh, so you have to work with the best limited information that you have. Um, and you have to make some kind of view. My, I mean, my, the, the point that I'm trying to make is the, the philosophical questions are, are very good and robust, and we're not going to solve them. But we do have to figure out something to do with these entities. Uh, so it is pragmatism, but it's pragmatism based on like an epistemological fallibility. We just don't know, and we're never going to know, but we have to act anyway. Vera? It freaks me out too. Oh my gosh, and it brings uh, so many parallels to sex robots. Yeah. Like the, but also the expectations of humans of what <clears throat> animals or robots should do. So here you have the cognitive perspectivity of a machine because a real animal sometimes goes and sleeps, right? And actually the zoo would benefit from the performance by an artificial being because right. it would be more Right. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to. Th I'd have to think about that more. Um, I'm not. I've not thought about that at all. I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't want to say something off the top of my head here. The part, the, the part of the video that you picked up on, though, was the part that I also found the most fascinating, which was the performative aspect of it. The fact that the people in the, the marina could not figure out what kind of thing it is, that was enough to prove my point, which is like, you're not going to know, but if, if you can still sufficiently fool enough people, it doesn't matter whether they're actually conscious or intelligent or sentient or haven't, it's, it's enough to grant rights to, right? Or it might be enough to grant rights to, legal rights to. And yeah. the fear then of, um, again, discrimination against the real thing when the real thing cannot perform as nicely as the artificial entity. 
Yeah. And so this is where we're getting into. Right. Yeah. Carrie, did you have a? I just have a whole swarming series of thoughts about the modern creation of animals. Yeah. 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 Because there's artificial animals and Blade Runner and the authentic animals are valued higher mm -hmm. than the artificial animals. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it's just stuff like class and tier entertainment experiences. Mm -hmm. Right. I think about the ways in which you know, we, tigers will still exist, right? And in theory, we could even be more protected. Right. But then what happens to the real tigers? Yeah. And No, 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 that's okay. I, I, I appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lexi. So you had mentioned intellectual property rights, and I was wondering why you might see a need to award IP rights to AI versus like the creator of the AI. Yeah, I don't know. That's a live question. So um, it, it's very reasonable to imagine a scenario where an artificial intelligence program creates something that is deserve, deserving of protection, right? I don't know whether that thing should be able to have the right to its own intellectual property or whether it should trace back. If it's truly an artificial intelligence, that programming is not created by the programmer, right? It's they created the programming for the machine to program itself, if that makes sense. Um, does that make sense? Let me pause there for a second. Uh, right? So they're not, it's not that the designer has invented that thing. They created the artificial pro intelligence program such that the thing invented this new thing worthy of intellectual property. Uh, I think there's a good argument that you could make that the designer did not create that. Yeah, I think it, I'd be on, on that side of it. I think it'd be almost like a, it's like your child, you know? Like, just because you made them doesn't mean you made the thought, but I wonder what kind of compensation AI would even want. Would they want credit for their invention? I mean, do they need to yeah. be, you know, written down as the, the person who had the patent on it? I mean, right. Yeah, maybe if they never express an interest in it, yeah. we're fine, but the moment where they start saying, wait a second, I'm experiencing a little resentment here uh, toward the creators. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's right. I feel like I should be getting something. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, do you remember? I think you emailed me uh, only this September. Um, a painting created by AI won actually right. an artistic award. Yeah. So the question is, was it created? Is it art? Who actually gets yeah. credit? Yeah. Did you see this? The, the 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 programmer created an artificial intelligence program, which would create which created this magnificent work of art, and then he won. And so the question was, there was a big controversy because it was like, well, he didn't create it; he created the program that created it. Uh, so yeah, imagine the scenario where the the artificial intelligence program says, "Well, wait a sec, this is my painting. I want some." Uh, and, another piece of that is that AI gets trained by. Right. Humans, and so have those humans' rights been some way violated if the AI gets credit yeah. for it? Is that different than uh, other artists that are influenced by other human art? Maybe no, not. not maybe. I've seen a lot of chatter about yeah. humans feeling somehow violated by, oh, that's not right. human art, it's stole from our art. Would it be different? I, I wonder. If, if the, the, the visual art would be different than like the literature or something, if you created an artificial, and prog artificial intelligence program which created a work of fantasy, right, and then that thing was bought by Amazon, just for example, uh, <laughs> hypothetically, it's, it's, it's like who is going to benefit there? You would be like Mickey Mouse, right? You hear yeah. About Right, right. Yeah. So would the creator get sued, or would the? Yeah, the, the problem with a lot of the artists, they have not been asked how they feel about having their work put into the data that it's mm. trained from. And a lot of artists have a very distinct style. I'm actually on Mid Journey a lot, 
And it's kind of shocking how you can create Escher prints or Sumi art. It's just phenomenal. Right. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad you brought up the example of the art. I'd, I'd sent it, but then I forgot it, and it's like totally related to this, so I should have had that in here. Well, but yeah. also the question of now you have programmers who say, well, I didn't write this program, this algorithm, because I created the first algorithm that now allows the algorithm to create and duplicate right. another algorithm. So then the question is who created it, or how did that happen if at the end we have something super powerful? Right. There's one, uh, this, there's an argument, I think this is in Searle. Uh, Jason, you probably know this better than I do. There's a, there's a famous analogy that uh, the, the uh, philosopher of mine, John Searle, does, uh, makes where he says it's like the Constitution that contains within itself the conditions to amend itself. Mm -hmm. And so it's like they didn't under, they didn't, the, the founders didn't foresee the 25th Amendment, but they created the conditions by which the 25th Amendment was created. So did the founders create the 25th Amendment or did they, are they sort of indirectly responsible for it? Uh, I think there might be something to that. that they did, they indire they're indirectly responsible, but if they're indirectly responsible, that means at least the, the artificial intelligence program is at least partially responsible and would be deserving of some kind of recognition, I think. Other, yeah, Jason. Yeah. Uh, and you're kind of taking the uh, kind of a descriptive or pragmatic approach and saying we have this all, and you're right, we have this, we have this all these problems. Right. Uh, it's coming, uh, how do we, you know, how are some other ways that we employ this? Um, but there's a lot of ways in which we do really bad. Like you said, a good example right. of how to employ rights. And there are lots of bad examples. I mean, there's, like in the Supreme Court today, they're deciding about uh, animal welfare issues, about pigs. Right. And, um, I mean, if I treated my dog like that, I would get called out. Right. Um, so, we're, I mean, in, so by like, the, you know, following how we do things might not be a good way about whether we should do it or not. Yeah, I, I don't think I was making any kind of claims about the, any kind of normative claims. Right. I was just saying, like, we're, we live in a democracy. <laughs> I think uh, this is <laughs> since the last time. <laughs> I, uh, uh, you know, we, we, at least for us, but it's not just for us. I mean, I was trying to bring in evidence from, a, from a, you know, abroad that, you know, these other communities and these other nation states are having similar kinds of issues. And we do screw up. I mean, rights are set back all the time. It, it happens. I don't, I don't want to get the, I don't want to give the uh, indication that, like, rights are always expanding and we're just, all, I mean, sometimes there are setbacks. Roe was a setback. Uh, uh, but I think I, I mean, generally I do think the, I mean, this is my bias, but I do think that the moral arc of the universe bends toward, you know, the good and inclusivity and stuff, and it takes time to do it. But I just don't know another, I don't know an alternative, right? We're, we have to do something. We live in a democracy, and democracies are sloppy and they mess up. But we have to do something. Right. Speak, and we don't know what they will reproduce in one or two or three years. From right. Now, right. I remember the first time I showed the Xenobots to my students. It was 2020, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, we've got, we've got organic machines." And then the next December, I went back to look at it, and it's like, "Oh, they replicated. They per they reproduced in a year. They figured out how to make more of themselves independently. That's not troubling at all." Uh, <laughs> So, so, yeah. Yeah, this is, I think, yeah. time to think about it. What are the implications, larger implications? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the Zeno, and the Xenobots, there's, they're funded by DARPA, so they've got money, they're backing them that's uh, efficient and scary. Yeah. Yeah. Mary? So I'm trying to formulate this question. I'm not sure I have it quite yet, but it's almost there. Um, one of the things that struck me in the Dolphin video 
Uh, it was real quick right at the beginning, but it was something this is better than real animals. Yeah. Because real animals, you don't want to put in a cage. Right. It's bad for them. Yeah. So it was partly from the animal welfare concern. Yeah. So it's okay to put the, yeah. the, dolphin, the, the robot dolphin in the tank. That's right. Um, so there's still an interesting difference in them, no matter how. At least them, right? Um, yeah. So that you know, relates to an issue of. You're talking about rights for robots, but that also implies liabilities for robots. Yes. So if a robot commits a crime, let's say. That's right. Can we punish a robot if they don't mind being in a cage? Right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I mean, don't we do that with animals too, right? Like if, if you have a wild animal, and, and I mean, wild animals are put down if they, if they harm people, right? Um, Law concerning guns. Gun yeah. Control. Yeah. Make the guns we don't shoot people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So th in that particular example of the dolphin, it's not feeling pain. So if you imagine a more, you know, they're talking about an artificial intelligence driven dolphin. Imagine one that's artificially intelligence driven and then also might have, might appear to have to experience pain. We don't know whether it's going to experience pain. I don't know that you experience pain, but it, it appears to experience pain. There's a good, there, you might have a similar argument that you need to take them out of the, the tanks, right? Um, or at least make sure that you're not giving them the appearance of, uh, of pain or intelligence or sentience or something. The parallel with sex robots in that uh, argument was astounding because um, some of the defenders of creating more sex robots is because they're going to save women from prostitution and being um, abused by um, their um, clients, so to say. Therefore, we should create that yeah. Exactly. So do they what? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The 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 arguments for these different kinds of entities are are, I think, are really interesting. I, I think it's really easy to depict like the worst case scenario of of why somebody would want to have an animal robot or a sex robot, but. You know, you could imagine somebody with, you, you could imagine an elderly person that can't really take care of, an, of a pet, but might want that sense of companionship. Kinship is another one of those uh, relations that often comes up in the literature, not societal need, but kinship. And so if, if grandma's robot, you know, Pomeranian or something, uh, Pomerobotian or something, uh, gets harmed, that that thing deserves res respect and it has legal rights afforded to it. Um, the the argument you know I've seen stuff in like uh, women and gender studies and queer studies for for the arguments for sex robots that uh, and, and in disability studies where people that might not typically be able to have a normal sexual relationship might want this as s sort of a proxy to to have a fully you know as much as it can approximate a fully developed sexual romantic relationship. Uh, so there might be good reasons to have these things, and if if, and I don't know that they're going away. Whether or not there's good or bad reasons to have them, they're not going away. So we need to think seriously about what, if any, protections they should have. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I really appreciate the attendance. Yeah. And I'll, I'll stick around for a few minutes if you want to chat a little bit more. Have you seen Lars and the Real Girl? No, Vera has told me to watch this movie for like five years, and I can't, I, I always forget about it. But I'm going to have to go back. Uh,